Hello and welcome for our session on talent uh, development. Top flight clubs and leagues across the globe have been increasingly investing in the search for the game's next Messi or Ronaldo. And in recent years, we've seen a lot of them launching kind of revamped academies, new programs, all with the goal to identifying and nurturing the next kind of stars. But the economic strains caused by the, the COVID crisis, the coronavirus pandemic, have put further strength, uh, pressure on, on the clubs to kind of actually spend even more time on uh, talent development. So we're going to be looking at you know, how successful these programs, programs have been um, and, and kind of look, the, looking at the journey uh, from really the academy to, to top flight success. Um, first, though, let, let me introduce you Kingsley uh, Pungong, the CEO of Rainbow Sports Global. Because um, I'd like to kind of, for, for you, first of all, Kingsley, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. Um, I, I'd really like to start, if you could uh, give us a bit of a snapshot on the state of football talent, um, the, 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 the state of the football talent pool and the game in Africa. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, interesting question. Today, Africa represents uh, the biggest youth population in the world. Uh, it has 70% of its population under the age of 30. It has a football culture. It has fast-growing economies. But the infrastructure is still uh, lagging behind as compared to more developed areas of the world, like North America, Europe, uh, and South America. And so there's an underrepresentation of Africans at the very top of the game. And there are several reasons for that. I get it. Um, and, and so what are the kind of... The, the opportunities, but as well the, the challenges with talent development uh, in, in Africa? No, what's happening today in the world is, uh, first of all, tal talent development is a time-consuming, expensive and unpredictable exercise. Uh, and so uh, footballers today are the most um, uh, desired uh, assets or commodities in the game because top-level footballers are not replicatable. So if you want another Messi, you cannot create another one. You have to buy Messi. So if you look at the, the, the financial flows today, the clubs earn colossal revenue from TV rights and sponsorship, but that money gets uh, immediately spent on talent, in wages, and in transfer fees. Uh, and the reason for this is because talent is, the talented players are the main actors. Now, if you look at um, what's happening in Africa today, um, Africa is very disconnected from the global ecosystem. And so with all the uh, huge sums of money floating in the game, there is a little trickle-down effect. Uh, and that's, mm. that's a problem, really from an Afrocentric perspective. From a global perspective, uh, the, the game is very well developed in, 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 in certain parts of the world. We can see countries like Serbia, Croatia, Uruguay that are uh, are, perf are performing even larger countries like the like uh, China, for example. Uruguay just has four million people, but it's producing world class players. Serbia, Croatia. That's because they have the culture and the infrastructure. Uh, and I think you can see it with the case of the United States, a lot of top Americans going to top clubs at the moment, which means it's a catching mm -hmm. up effect. It's a country with a tradition of producing talent. Uh, and I think. Um, over the years to come, with technology having democratized the space, I will see an expansion in, 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 the, in the pool of talented players coming from different parts of the world. Now we have talented players coming out of Korea, out of North America. South America has the tradition of producing a long line of players, Europe as well. I think Africa with the development infrastructure will catch up with time and it's going to be very interesting for the years to come. You mentioned a few countries here. In Africa, where, where do you think are going to be the next kind of hotbeds for, for kind of global talent? I think in Africa at the moment, uh, the West Africans edge it at the moment. Senegal has a very robust infrastructure and recently has been producing a lot of players. Mali is doing well. Ghana has a tradition. Nigeria is still uh, underperforming, uh, but has huge potential because of the population, the size. And I think Nigeria is one country that can match Brazil in terms of player production. But I would say, I would take a bet that the, the next wave of great African players will come from East Africa because of the population 
uh, and athletic culture. Countries like Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, I think we'll see more, more players coming from these countries over the next uh, five to 10 years. And you mentioned uh, kind of, you know, the, the kind of players as a kind of commodity and like, why talent has become the most priced commodity in global football? What, what's, what's the reason behind that? If you can go a little deeper, please. The, the reason behind that is because talent put bombs on seats. They are the actors. Uh, they generate the revenue because fans want to see uh, extraordinary talent. And uh, mm -hmm. because they're not, top talent is not replicatable, as I said before. You cannot buy another Ronaldo. You cannot create another Messi. And so uh, there's a huge premium. On the top players. If you look at Mbappe to then the valuations around Mbappe, if Mbappe is transferred, the agency fee alone could buy Sunderland, you know, for example. And so that tells you uh, this huge pressure uh, to find uh, the next superstar is akin to the arms race. All the clubs uh, are deploying great resources to find or produce the next great player. Absolutely. So one last question before we bring in uh, some other panelists uh, uh, to join our conversation, Kingsley. Um, I mean, why do some nations you think kind of overachieve in terms of talents vis-a-vis -vis others? And especially at times you see smaller countries that produce an outsized number of talent. I think about the Netherlands and Belgium versus larger nations uh, kind of seem to struggle at times still to kind of catch up. Why is there a difference? Infrastructure, culture, systems, uh, and resources. Uh, the Netherlands has one of the biggest, best uh, development platforms in the world, a tradition for excellence. Uh, the football purist, Portugal is another one with 9 million people. Portugal probably has a bigger representation in the Champions League than Africa with a billion people. It comes down to uh, economics, culture, infrastructure, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, 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 and resources, which is uh, on the flip side, you see India or, or China that has the resources, but hasn't got the culture hasn't got the infrastructure, they're building the infrastructure, but the infrastructure in this case includes not just the fiscal infrastructure, but the human resource and all what comes with it. Um, and so that's why some countries actually overachieve or, over, uh, or are ahead of the game in terms of production. Countries like Uruguay, Croatia, Serbia, these are smaller countries with a um, very prolific uh, record and great pedigree. Just one, one follow-up question. Do you think China and India are likely to kind of catch up in, in this kind of talent development race? Absolutely. I think China will, within the coming years, they haven't got it right at the moment because there's all of, there's a lot of autocratic capital flowing to Chinese football. And that autocratic capital uh, is not necessarily, those who deploy that autocratic capital are not necessarily football savvy. So there's a clash in China because authority comes from above and it's very, very difficult to implement. But China has the resources. Uh, I personally have been fortunate to travel China extensively over the last five years. They have the resources that are building world-class infrastructure. And I just think it's a matter of time before they get it right. And if Korea can produce players, China can produce players. So I think China, like the United States, will not be whipping boys in 20 years' time. Interesting. Thanks for that. So you mentioned uh, Portugal, so we, we've got somebody from there too. So let, let me open up the panel to uh, our other guest. We have Maggie and Tim, CEO of Trinity3 Agency, um, and Domingos Soares, Chief Executive of Benfica Group, the storied Portuguese uh, football club. Thanks for uh, joining us. Um, so, really, uh, Domingos, I'd like to start with you. Benfica is, is known really for producing some of the best players ever, particularly recently. Just think of Ruben Diaz, who now plays for Manchester City, and Joao Felix, who's now plays at, at Atletico Madrid. Just these two players generated about you know 200 million euros uh, in in sales. Um, so, what, what's what's the Benfica model? How do you develop talent? Maybe you can kind of open up on that question. Well, thank you, James. I think that the, the most important thing is that maybe 15 years ago in 2006, uh, we decided to have uh, youth development as a strategic path for our own development. In fact, in, in, uh, in Europe, if you want to play and to fight against big clubs like Barca, Real Madrid, uh, Man United, Man City, 
in a country like Portugal, where the TV revenues are quite low, uh, it would be impossible uh, with the same kind of uh, revenues, uh, TV rights, sponsorship, uh, ticketing. Only with that, it would be impossible to, to attract and to retain some of the good players. So we decided to go with a strategic project. So it's not just for use development. It's because it's really important for Benfica. And since then, the, 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 the amount of uh, time, energy that we spent on, on youth development was uh, really high. Now, when you ask what's, what's behind the success that we've had, uh, we have today something like 19 uh, players uh, prepared in our academy that are today playing in the big five countries. I would say that the first thing is talent. You need to have access to talent. Without players that are well talented, that are very good uh, football players, it would be impossible. So the raw material is really mandatory. The second one is the mentality. And we need, in fact, those, I'm always trying to differentiate the good players from the fantastic players. And very often, it's not about the talent they have both. It's much more about the mentality. You need to have a winning mentality. You need to have a fighting mentality. And the difference, uh, when I say, for example, Ruben, uh, is, I'm not sure if, it is, if he is the most talented central defender, but his mentality is the right one that you need in order to succeed at the highest level. The third process is that you have to have, uh, like Kinsley just mentioned, you have to have very good infrastructure, which we do. You have to have a good methodology and you have to have good technology. And people at the center, not only for the players, but also for coaches, teachers, tutors, etc. So those, I would say, are the ingredients in order to succeed uh, at the highest level when you develop this use uh, project that we have in, in Benfica. You mentioned infrastructure as Kingsley did. I mean, how much of the money that you can raise from selling this talent is then reinvested directly into infrastructure. Is that the biggest portion or how is it split more or less? No, it's not the, big pro the biggest portion. Uh, I think that uh, our academy today, to, to say that on average, we spend something like uh, 10 to 12 million euros in the academy. When I say the academy is the infrastructure, plus the coaches, plus the 100 rooms that we have and the kids who live there and restaurant, etc. Uh, in fact, when we start a single year, clubs like Benfica, but I would say the same situation for uh, peers like Lyon, Olympique de Lyon, or Ajax, etc., we have a deficit in total revenues and the amount of money we spend on salaries. And mm -hmm. you need, in order to generate more money from the academy, in order to fulfill the gap that we have between uh, revenues and costs. So. It's not about reinvesting all the money we have, although it is really important to, to keep investing because, uh, as you mentioned, there are a lot of countries, a lot of clubs, a lot of academies being uh, developed right now. And to keep the difference, you need to continue investing and to think about things different from uh, the traditional education that you, you have in an academy. Just to give you an example, uh, when you think about uh, a football or a soccer academy, you always think about uh, football uh, pitches. Okay, We need, in fact, to give new experience to the youngest ones in terms of other sports, which are important for them in terms of the physical education, uh, although they will always be a football player. So those are the kind of things that we are uh, promoting right now in the academy to have our own school for them in order to be well educated until they are 18 years old. And then they will decide what, what else they want to do in terms of career. But this is also important because I think that we, today we have something like 200 kids living in, in the academy. And among those 200, maybe 190 will not succeed at the highest level. So you need to give them tools in order that they succeed as men in the future. Absolutely. And I think it's important to remind our, our viewers in terms of perspective, there's, you know, the, the, there's 10 out of, uh, out of 100, out of 200 who make it, the rest are kind of not going to be necessarily like the Rubens or, or, or Felix of, of the future. Thanks for that, uh, uh, Dominguez.
Um, I, I'd like to um, get uh, Maggie's perspective um, um, about, you know, you've been kind of, uh, you've got extensive experience in connecting Yes Talent with, with Europe's talent. Uh, in the last year, we've seen a lot of American raised players making kind of a splashy entry into the European top five leagues. Can you tell us like what's happening? A lot of people I, I talked to are like kind of really curious, like why is there so much American talent finally being so impressive in Europe? Yeah, well, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, it's interesting that you say that question, right? That people say, well, why is it that now all of a sudden American talent is becoming so popular? I feel like American talent has always been there, um, but it just it just took a certain time and it's also about the right timing. And, and this is the right time, um, as you're seeing with players like McKinney and uh, Reggie Cannon, and obviously you have guys like even Brian Reynolds who now just went over to AS Roma. And so that that says a lot about the talent. Um, and I think from the development side, you know, for years with the uh, DA and them deciding to, you know, kind of like abolish that and then start creating these new uh, programs like MLS Next, um, you will see more. You know, you definitely see more. I think if you start looking at even the USA as a whole and start saying, well, you know, which which area is like the hotbed for talent? And that's obviously states like Florida produces some great talent. Um, but Texas is like definitely, you know, the one, especially in that Dallas market. And, and the majority of those players that you see um, from the U U.S. men's national team, as well as in those countries like Italy and um, Germany, come from, you know, the, the Texas area. So it's it's definitely, there needs to be a lot more work done, but the process of what they're doing now is starting to work, but there's still some room for more um, development and more growth. Interesting. One thing that I, I find interesting is that a lot of these younger players uh, from the U.S. have actually made their first kind of debut in, in Europe in, in the in the German league. Um, and then they've moved on to the Premier League. You, you mentioned Ken McKenney going to Juventus in, in Serie A. What, is, there, is there a German-US connection going on here? What, what's going on? Um, what, well, see, McKinney is a little bit different because obviously, you know, when he was younger, he spent some time there. So that's kind of like, I don't want to use him as the full example, but, um, you know, there, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's the Germany uh, US connection. Um, but quite frankly, if you ask me, Germany is probably one of my favorites um, in terms of development. I mean, and, and we see that with the talent that's even in nice. uh, Premier League now that has come from Bundesliga. Um, and so, you know, and then, and then now even you see in the States where clubs like um, Orange County has developed partnerships with. Um, clubs within um, Bundesliga, you see FC Cincinnati doing partnerships with um, Hoffenheim and, and those groups there. So it, it you know, it, it's something about Germany and the USA and, and that pathway has kind of been created. And I think if they continue to follow that model, that'll work. And also Kingsley brought up a good point about the Netherlands too, being another place where there's some great development because you see guys going to IX and, you know, or, or PSV and getting that um, development there as well. So I, I think if they continue on this pathway, um, but really make that investment um, from a young age here in the U.S., it can definitely be something even greater than what it is now. So just to be clear, we're seeing kind of some of the German clubs effectively investing in academies in the US, that's a way that they can start scouting talent early on and then kind of inserting them into their talent pipeline in Europe. Is, is, did I understand that correctly? Yes, that, um, that's a way. I, I think another area too that could be um, tapped into is the college market too here um, in the US. You know, you have a lot of young uh, kids coming from these international countries and they wanna go to school here in America and of course, many will say, well, once you play college, you know, soccer, it's not the same. But if there's a pathway that can be created where there's talent coming from 
you know, those countries like Germany or um, Netherlands, even England, right? Even England. And, and we find a way to say, okay, they're coming from these countries. And even though they're, they didn't go the path like McKinney did, but they're coming to school, they're getting their education, they can play here and develop here and, and then be able to kind of go to those clubs that have those partnerships with um, those groups within like Bundesliga or whatnot. Um, I believe it could be something something great. And and honestly, if you just take a look at the MLS Super Draft that just passed, this is the most international um, young men that have been drafted. So that, that says a lot. Absolutely. Um, Kingsley, um, w one thing uh, that you, you mentioned in, in the past is like kind of, you know, you spoke about the, the democratization of talent scouting. Uh, what does that mean and how does it kind of tap into uh, precisely finding talent in, in, in ways that we haven't maybe done so before? The world has become smaller uh, as a result of technology. I remember when I was a student in England a few years back, a couple of years back, Arsene Wenger went to France and brought uh, Patrick, uh, brought Emmanuel Petit and brought Vieira and Anelka. Anelka came from PSG. And at the time, none, none of the English clubs had, had many French talent. If you fast forward five, ten years later, every British club had a scout in France. The world has become smaller. Um, today, with access of video footage and platforms like Y Scout, uh, everybody has access to information. Everybody has access to data, and um, and so it's be, it's become a very frightening race to find find the next player. And it's easier for clubs to access information. That's why I say it's become more democratized. Interesting, um, Domingos. I, I wanted to kind of go back to you. One thing about kind of you know. How has the pandemic made talent scouting kind of, and just kind of dealing with interruptions and like, how has the club dealt with that? And how has it impacted your, your kind of process? Well, it's, uh, it's impossible to scout if you don't have matches, okay? And, and uh, the problem today, not only in Portugal, but just talking about the situation in Portugal is that from the, we have different teams until you reach uh, the A team. So it starts at the age of four, five, six years old until the B team. We have an under 15, under 17, under 19, uh, under 23, and the B team. From all those teams, right now, only the, B, the A team, the B team, and the under 23 are playing and having training sessions. So for our scout department, it's almost impossible to try to see what's happening not only in the country but uh, but uh, outside the country so it, it, it's it's really difficult and we are concerned not because we don't scout but because for the young kids today we start to see some problems some mental and psychological uh, fatigue so it's 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 really a, a problem i think that we are not yet in a situation where we say that we are losing a generation but you have to consider that if those young kids today who are 15, 17 years old, they have stopped uh, their training sessions and their matches for more than one year, almost one year, uh, they will be affected by that. So, so it's a real concern for, for, uh, for the, the near future. And, and just to stay on that point, are you bringing in people to help with mental health issues? And like, how do you deal with the trauma that, that is caused by, by the pandemic? And, and precisely like kind of staying on the sidelines? Yeah, we have people taking care of them. Well, in fact, we always had, okay? Because we have a lot of those uh, kids living uh, in our academy. We prefer them to stay close to the family. But in some cases, they are coming from different uh, parts of Portugal and different parts of the globe. So we have to take care of them. And, and the mental uh, problem has always been faced by us as something that we have to pay special attention. So, yes, there are, uh, there are special teams uh, linked with the players and especially also linked with the, their families because their families will play a very important role in their development. Uh, I'll come back to families because I think that's an important issue uh, and agents as well. But given that we're talking about kind of protecting the players, Kingsley, I wanted to kind of ask you, uh, you know, to you know, how 
important has it become to kind of, you know, in, in the career of, of an athlete, uh, help them kind of plan kind of the kind of financial stability, future investments to what, what is the role that, that an agent or a financial advisor have in, in doing that? Uh, so kind of I'm looking for things kind of off the pitch rather than on the pitch. I think I think Domingo mentioned that football today has become has gone beyond the field. It's about developing not just the the player but also the whole person, and it's fundamentally important to uh, give uh, players basic education on finance, but not just give them basic education on finance, but put an infrastructure around them that will guarantee that uh, they are diligent with the investments that they make and they make sensible investments. And and the only way uh, that happens if the player is educated to know that that process is necessary. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's important because football is a short career. These guys are very healthy and very fit. If you retire at 34, you still have 50 years ahead of you. So it's critically important uh, to have the structure around players and to give them the education that makes them realize that it's necessary to engage professionals in terms of looking at alternative investments. Absolutely. Maggie, how, how, how important is that to you? And like, what role do you play in advising the players that you work with? Oh, that's very important. Um, in fact, I don't sign players that, you know, uh, don't have that vision to or create that plan to say, OK, this is this is how I want you know my career to be. You know, we understand, obviously, you know, on the field, that's extremely important, but also it's important to build that legacy off the field. And so, you know, there's different things um, that I do with my players. Um, another requirement is, is having ties to community, um, charities, foundations. Um, if, if they're not thinking of maybe starting their own, maybe there's a charity or foundation that they are passionate about. And so, you know, my team and I, we get together and we, we um, put together that partnership and that plan to say, okay, you know, let's try to plan two or three charitable events um, for the year uh, for each um, player. And so it, it's extremely important. And, and I mean, if you look at just sports today, um, you see that. And within other um, sports, and you'll see athletes really, really owning what they do off the field. And I think that's extremely important in a sport like football, because these guys have just major influence and they control and have all the power. And so it's so important to build that legacy off the field. Absolutely. So we're starting to get some questions from our audience and I invite other uh, members of the audience to kind of send their, their question in. Let me start uh, with one for uh, Domingos. So the question is, how important is it to establish partnerships with clubs in other countries, continents, in terms of player development, scouting, and growth of the infrastructure of the youth program. So how do you do that? Well, that's a very interesting question. We have spent um, a lot of time initially uh, preparing ourselves to go abroad. And this means that we have today uh, people, uh, technology, and methodology in order to, uh, if we want to export our know-how, we know how to do that. Okay. And like Kinsley, I've been in China, I've been in the United States for, for uh, almost, I don't know how many times, but in the last uh, three, four years, I spent a lot of time in the States. We have already partners in place. And uh, I believe that uh, even contrary to other, uh, to other big clubs who are trying to, do, to export their brand, in our case, we don't have this, this, uh, this uh, goal for us is much more about exporting our know-how more than the, the brand uh, real madrid or barca or man united they have a brand that we cannot compete okay we have a very good legacy but today uh, there are some clubs who are global and the other clubs who are not and we are not uh, in the same let's say in the same in the same battlefield nevertheless in terms of expertise and you see that in the rankings from, from for example the 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 football uh, uh, observatory that uh, considers how much time and how much, not how much time, but the, the level of uh, your youth development. 
we are among the top three. It's us, Ajax, and, and Barca. So we have this expertise and we are ready to go abroad. And uh, again, we don't want uh, those, uh, let's say, Americans to come to Portugal very soon. We want them to live in their own country with their families and we want to support the local entities. It can be academies or it can be clubs to develop those uh, young. Then th there will be a time where you will need to increase uh, the level of challenge that they have. So maybe it's a time, like uh, I mentioned that to, to the Chinese authorities, there will be a time that we have to take those players and bring them to Europe. But it's not very, very soon. It's not when they are maybe 15 or 16 years old. It's too soon to do that. Okay, so, so yes, ready to go already with a lot of uh, programs outside uh, Portugal uh, from countries like China, Ukraine, Egypt, uh, in some countries also in Europe, uh, and special attention to the States. Is there any practical example, just a quick question, like any, any, any actual partnership that you've had? In terms of those those uh, countries that, uh, that I mentioned, or... maybe in China, in the, in, in um, Chuking province, we had uh, the development of uh, uh, several schools. This was done together with local authorities, and we learn a lot from uh, from this Chinese market. They learn from us, and we learn from them. And the fact is that in China. Uh, it's the whole infrastructure that you have to change because it's about culture. It's about the parents giving time to their kids to spend time playing football, not only yeah. uh, uh, learning uh, at school. So it, it's, it, you need to change everything. But I think that they want to do that and clubs like us and others and like Kinsley, I'm sure, they, we are ready to, to support them. Interesting. I have another really good, good question, uh, um, maybe f for Kingsley, and it's like, what safeguards do you have in place to stop the exploitation of children in a global football market? That's, that, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. And, and I think there's a lot of controversy around, um, around that. FIFA a few years ago outlawed the transfer of players under the age of 13, um, under the guise that uh, minors need to be protected. I think with any industry uh, where there's a huge amount of money going around, there's always the tendency for unscrupulous actors. If you look at it in, in, in oil, oil companies have issues with, with uh, uh, spilling and, and all kinds of things. So the, 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 the key here is that um, clubs have to have the balance right between providing opportunity and also protecting uh, the players. And I think the first thing is to be able to uh, uh, regular, regulate the industry, which FIFA is doing now with uh, the regulation of inter intermediaries, uh, and also um, uh, making sure that talent that comes uh, to join clubs outside of their home country is protected. And that can only be done through legal forcible instruments. Uh, but I think it's improving. It's not where it should be, but it's improving. Thank you. Um, I have another really good question. I mean, I have to say the quality of the questions from, from our audience are, are, are excellent. Uh, so, soon reporters will be redundant here at the Business of Football Summit. Um, I have a question for you, Maggie. Um, is there a risk of excessive hype on all of these young players when there's a sudden spike of interest in a specific region? So I think this is kind of pertinent to the yes. And then there's this follow-up is like, this, which could eventually lead to potential repercussions and pressure uh, on the development of young players. So uh, I think this is really relevant to you because you're bringing a lot of these kind of, there's this new interest towards kind of US uh, players. So what, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, man. I think it also goes back to when we discussed earlier about, you know, like mental health and, and just dealing with the pressures of, you know, wanting to feel like, okay, I want to be the next Weston McKinney, Christian Pulisic, or I, you know, I, I want to be Gio Reyna, but 
realistically, um, I'm not there yet. And, you know, I, I think I, I would say figuring out a way to present the idea to players that they're not, you know, the, the next McKinney or, it's, it, you know, to the point of what Kingsley said about reproducing and creating another like Messi or Ronaldo. It's it's like, no, you, you want to be yourself and, you know, um, the goal is to create you into that star. And so um, it, it does put a lot of pressure on the players, but I, I think once again, just with the right development, taking into account, you know, mentally how that affects the players. It, it, unfortunately, there are there would be some repercussions, but not really if if steps are taken and the right measures are taken to handle it. Well, interesting. Thank you, Maggie. Um, Dominguez, one thing that like um, I think it's important to mention, like Benfica was in the center of the so-called football leagues. A lot of secrets of the club was were kind of revealed in terms of like its relationships with the agents and whatnot. To what extent has that kind of those revelations kind of impacted your efforts to kind of develop talent, search for new talent? Was that kind of how did you deal with that? Well, no, no impact. I have to say, no impact. We have regarding the agents. We have a very good relationship with agents, and uh, I have to say that they have a very, very important role in those youngsters' development, uh, almost at the same level as uh, their their parents. Okay, uh, I always take the example of Ruben because I think it's most probably one of the best examples we have here. These these guys stayed in Benfica for more than ten years. He spent more than ten years in 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 our academy, and he had opportunities to go abroad sooner than he went now uh, for uh, for City. Okay, and and the fact is that in terms of readiness, in terms of uh, of uh, of uh, his ability to succeed at a club like City, he would need to spend more time in Benf in Benfica. And not only accepted that, his family accepted that, but also his agent. So this shows the importance of a good agent instead of, and we had the case also, that when a, when a young kid is almost 18 years old, uh, the agent is already promising him to go to a different country, to a different club, etc. And most of the cases we have today, they don't succeed there. They need more time to be nurtured here in Benfica. So, Coming back to your question, no problems with agents. Uh, I think that you, you know that we are not only a club, but also a licit company. All the deals we do, they have to be become public. Okay, so we send information to the market and there was no reason to, to, to be afraid of anything. Fair enough. And uh, to what extent though, you mentioned agents and parents. I mean, I, I, I went through a youth academy in, in Italy, Serie A. And I mean, I remember from, you know, the age of 14, you're constantly pressured by a bunch of talents. And for some of the kids in, in the case when I was in Italy, you know, the parents, like they saw for, you know, their kids' success in, in football was like kind of the gateway towards prosperity. I mean, that is a lot of pressure on, on the kids. How do you protect the players? And I, I ask you, maybe Domingos, and then I'm kind of keen to hear how, how you and, uh, and, uh, and uh, how Maggie and um, Kingsley think about this. So how do we protect the, the, the kids from their families? It's, it's, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a important uh, question. No, I, I understand your question. Just joking. I think that we need to train the parents. Very, very uh, honestly, we have sessions with the parents. And we train the parents because we say, in order that you, your kid succeeds, you need to be a high, uh, high competitive parent, which doesn't mean that you put a lot of pressure. It's maybe on the contrary, but you need to have the right message at the right time. You don't need to be uh, in, 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 in close to your kid when he's playing and saying what he has to do instead of the coach, etc. So families play a very, very important role. Uh, it's true that uh, I would say maybe 80 or 90% they see 
their son's career as probably the only way of uh, having some financial stability. And we tend to tell them that they have to manage their uh, expectations on the right way. But it's really important to take control of the parents because otherwise they will jeopardize their kids. Absolutely. Maggie, Kingsley, do you have any, Maggie, you go first. You have a keen to hear your views on, on this matter. Yeah, I think everything that Dominguez said is, um, I agree. It's important to educate the parents um, because a lot of times too, you know, like you said, sometimes parents will see that child, whether it's bo uh, boy or girl, um, and, and see them as, you know, the meal ticket, if you will. And um, it, it's important that they understand the process behind that and, and what that takes to um, that you know, their son or daughter getting to that uh, place. And so the education part is number one, it's it's key. But then also too, from an agent side, it's letting that parent know that, you know, you're trusting me to work with your child and you have to understand that um, agents are agents and they're professionals and, and we have a job to do. And as long as the parents know that and understand that, um, you know, it, it also helps in terms of like releasing that that pressure, because then at mm -hmm. least if the parent is highly competitive toward, you know, to the child to say, hey, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. But then that's where having that relationship too with the agent can um, help. And, and the agent can kind of let the parents know, like, look, you know, this is something that we can also handle. Um, and, and there's different approaches to it so that th that child is not feeling um, highly, highly pressured that I must do this, but I still can be successful without receiving so much pressure from my parents. Totally. King Kingsley? You know, football is a game that is uh, synonymous with, uh, with excitement, it stirs passions. Uh, it affects everybody. I mean, some of the executives around football in signing players uh, are excited and make uh, uh, not well thought out decisions. It's the same with the parents. Because of the excitement and the fact that it stirs passions, it also creates heightened expectations. But as as Domingo uh, uh, clearly eloquently stated, it comes down to training. For for parents to be self-regulated, they need to be trained, and that job falls uh, in the. That's a responsibility for the clubs and the agents who are professional actors uh, and have more information about talent development than the parents. I think it's incumbent on the on the on the clubs. And the agents to educate the parents that it's a uh, it's a tough road to travel and uh, excitement needs to be secondary. Excellent, thank you. I have a question uh, from the audience for all of you, um, and it basically goes uh, like this: Do you believe that the prices paid for players nowadays are fair, or should they be lower? And the examples that he raises are Mbappe and Joao Felix. So, I mean, the way I would kind of also add this is like. Are we in a bubble of valuation? And is that bubble potentially about to burst given uh, the pandemic? Maggie, you want to go first? I, 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 <laughs> I was hoping you would go first. <laughs> um, man, this is always a touchy uh, subject because, you know, I mean, and especially when you're mentioning names like Mbappe, right? And, and what... Um, and, and just what he has done and so far <laughs> in his career. Um, I, don't, I don't see it being, um, or, or I think your question was about like the bubble bursting. Uh, um, I, I think it only raises the profile for more, you know, talent to, to strive for excellence and, and want to be uh, valued much higher. I, I will say though, with the pandemic, it has affected a lot. I mean, we've seen that, you know, last summer with even some of the transfers and, you know, some players opting to not, um, you know, transfer and, and waiting, which I think, you know, quite frankly, was a, a better decision for most of the players that opted not to, you know, transfer. Um, but, you know, I do believe that, unfortunately, you know, with the pandemic, what we've seen, but things will pick it back up and and definitely this summer is is a window to look at. Um, I just think with the valuations, 
of these players, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, if you ask me, I, I think, like I said before, it just raises the value for um, other players to, you know, strive to want to be at the top. Totally. And I was thinking, probably Paris Saint-Germain fans think that B the money spent on Bappé was well spent after the, the victory against Barcelona. So, Kingsley, what's, what's your yeah. view? Well, my view is, is, is very clear. It, uh, it's a function of demand and supply. Where there's demand and uh, there's limited supply, uh, as we see with top level level talent, then the prices go up. We also look at, have to look at athletes as not just individual but brands. If you think that Cristiano Ronaldo has more social media followers than Nike than the entire Premier League put together, you realize that he becomes a very very marketable commodity. And on a worldwide basis, his image right, you would actually say the price that is paid for him is, is quite modest. I think that Felix will serve uh, Atletico de Madrid for another 10 years and is desired by other big clubs, then I think his value holds true. So I, I don't think it's, it's an exaggerated amount or a bubble. I think it's just driven by demand and supply. And don't be surprised, we are not far away from the world's next 1 billion uh, footballer, I would say. I'll put it at 10 to 15 years. But I mean, just to be on the flip side, and I'm coming to you, Domingo, and we don't have a lot of time. I mean, look at the strain that Barcelona is in, in retaining Messi. So then there's a question of sustainability that should also be, be, be kept in mind. Domingo, to you. Yeah, I think that you have uh, today some uh, global brands, clubs, are, uh, you have maybe 12, 13, 15 global brands in, in, in the industry. But those players, the guys who are above 100 million euros, they are also global brands like Kinsley just mentioned. And very often, and I saw that from some colleagues that I had in the European Club Association, uh, very often you pick one of those players, not only because he will uh, give you a lot of return on the pitch, but also off the pitch in terms of exposure of your brand. So I don't see it as a bubble, very honestly. Thank you for, for that last uh, question. Um, I'd like to thank our audience for, for your questions. They were fantastic. And for listening, I'd like to thank our panelists, Kingsley, Maggie, and Dominguez. It was a pleasure talking to you. And please continue you. following uh, our Business of Football conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.